Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Uh, greetings of peace and blessings to all. I'm honored to be moderating uh, this session, and I would like to call on uh, the speakers that uh, was invited to be part of this uh, conversation. Our first speaker, ladies and gentlemen, was born and raised in Subang Jaya. He was in politics out of high school. He joined the Democratic Action Party at the age of 22. He's two bachelors from Australian National University, focused in political science and Asian studies. He received his master's in regional integration from the University of Malaya here in Malaysia. And his first electoral post was MP, representing Bukit Bendara Penang. Ladies and gentlemen, our Def Deputy Defense Minister of Malaysia, Liu Chin Tong. Our next speaker is the Chairman and Group Chief Executive of Petra Group, a Malaysian company that focuses on rubber recycling, biotechnology, and financial software. He's also a Chairman of Sekhar Foundation. He is a poet and a playwright. He is an avid fan of Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse and has over 290 ties that is Walt Disney. You'll see he's wearing one of this right now. He can afford this because he was named by Forbes magazine as Malaysia's 28th richest man. Ladies and gentlemen, Datuk Vinod Sekhar. So, capitalism is an economic system based on private ownership as means of production and their operation for profit, where greed is defined as an insatiable longing for material gain. Gentlemen, our topic at hand is the economy of greed, can capitalism reform itself? I would like to open by inviting you on your thoughts on the topic. Deputy Minister, please. Um, thank you, Joanne, uh, the, the, one of the richest men in the country. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, who is a friend. Um, to everyone here, a very good afternoon. Today is International Labour Day. It is interesting that we talk about capitalism yes, yes. on, on Labour Day. How long is your street for? Just... Uh, just to answer your question, yes, yes, yes. just okay. your thoughts, your okay. thoughts on capitalism <laughs> and uh, greed. <I> think <laughs> capitalism was reformed once in a major way yes. in nineteen thirties. Yes, under Roosevelt, uh, New Deal, and eventually Keynes. Can capitalism be reformed? Yes, but capitalism, how to reform? It goes back to the point of labor. When we talk about capitalism, very often we, especially over the last 30 years since 1989, since 1989, since the collapse of Soviet, since the, what they call the, the end of Berlin Wall, the crumbling of Berlin Wall, as if there was no alternative. Capitalism was the only way. Now, what happened was that during this period of 30 years, there was no alternative check on capitalism. Now, capitalism is only good if there is a check and balance. And the role of government, I think, is important. We, we must not succumb to the idea that everything is about market. We need to have a different logic. We need not just about market logic. We need a social logic. We need a government logic. Uh, so that we don't see government as a problem, but we see the society as a situation in which market uh, society and government play complementary role 
in order to sustain capitalism. And it is important for us to go back to 100 years to find what happened in 1930s. What happened in 1929, what happened in 1930s was because capitalism, because of greed, it resulted in massive unemployment. Now, we are now seeing unemployment everywhere. We are seeing underemployment everywhere. We are seeing low pay everywhere. While at the same time, we see inequality, the gap between the rich and poor widening. It is time for us to come back to look at how to create jobs for the many. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, to our... Uh, okay, now you got, you got the political answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, look, I'm a businessman. I'm a capitalist. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to make it very simple. Capitalism will save the world. Not this nonsense of socialism, not communism, not all the other crap that you hear. Capitalism, but true capitalism. All right? What is true capitalism? How do I make money? I make money by selling you a product and you a service. How do I make more money? I find more of you. Okay? I make more money as long as more people have money. Which means I need to play a role in lifting people out of poverty. I have to play whatever role I can to push people out of poverty into the middle class. Why? So I can take their money. It's a selfish thing, but it works. True capitalism is about wealth creation. It's about sustainable wealth creation. We have forgotten what that is. And, you know, when you don't play a role in lifting people out of poverty, if you don't play a role in societal development, what happens is you cannibalize your own market. And then everything implodes. And you have prime examples. I'm sorry, Philippines, historically. Zimbabwe. When you don't play a role in lifting people up, everything collapses. And then I make less money. And I'm a capitalist. I want to make money. Right? So which means I have to play a role in societal development. The days of businesses not participating in, in the society's reform, in society's issues, are gone. We have to be involved. We have to play a role in political reform. We have to play a role with government on helping people rise so that we can keep wealth, sustainable wealth being created. Now, you mentioned greed. You're absolutely right. But greed is neither good nor bad. Greed just is. Greed is a part of humanity. Right? I mean, we can't, it, it, we're greedy for love, we're greedy for ambition, we're, we're greedy for jobs, we're greedy for money. We're greedy for many things. The issue is can we temper it? Yes. We have to temper greed. Greed is a powerful engine. It's like having a powerful Bugatti, right? A seven-liter sports car. If you don't know how to drive that car, you're either going to kill yourself or kill someone else. But if you can accelerate at the right time, you can brake at the right time, you can take the curves, then you have control over a very, very powerful engine. And that's all greed is, a very powerful engine. How you use it, how you temper it, decides how things go forward. So we have to redefine how we define profit, how businessmen operate in society. And again, we're talking about reforming capitalism. I don't think it's a question of reforming capitalism. It's a question of understanding what true capitalism actually is. And true capitalism allows everyone to grow. I mean, the Deputy Minister will agree with me. In Malaysia, we are a prime example of near social capitalism. We are pro-business, but we try to take care of everyone. We try to give health care to everyone. We try to give education to everyone. So it comes down to the basics. Full head, full stomach, and a roof over your head. Right? That must be the minimum the society must provide. Yes. After that, it should be a free-for-all. You want to have a Rolls Royce and a private jet? Go for it. You're happy just to have a roof over your head and, and, and three meals a day? That's fine. But I think this is the kind of debate we need. Yes. And again, I'm going to say this again. Capitalism will save the world. Not socialism, not communism, not any other thing. Thank you. Turn back 10 years ago, um, the Sumgreb mortgage crisis occurred when banks sold too many mortgages to feed the demand for the mortgage-backed securities sold through the secondary market. When home prices fell down in 2006, it triggered defaults. The risk spread to mutual funds, pension funds, and corporations who own these derivatives. 
The ensuing 2007 banking crisis and the 2008 financial crisis produced the world's worst recession since the Great Depression. Last year, a Gallup survey found out that about 45% of the youth adults in America, or the U.S., have has a favorable view of capitalism, while 51% see socialism in a positive light. So there's a, a sort of a shift in terms of uh, perhaps having a hybrid, as you've said, of capitalism and socialism combined. Um, if you were given the opportunity, because there's, they're saying that there's a bigger one looming in the air right now, uh, if you were given one chance to, to do anything, uh, how are you able to prepare this in your own areas, perhaps in politics and in business, if, if, you, if there's an impending, impending crisis again, which in a lot of ways they say cycles about 10 to 8, eight to 10 years. So it's time. It's, it's time for that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do the business part and we'll give the politics part okay. to a smarter person than me. Um, look, temper greed. We are never going to stop going through cycles. All right? So what is a cycle? A cycle just means there's a period where we've got to hatch it down and just hold ourselves and it'll pass. Right? It, it happens all the time. It happens roughly every 10 years, give or take. And it's going to happen. And we have to be ready for it. But how can we be ready? Very simplistically, temper greed. You know, we don't, you know... <laughs> You know, let's take, you know, it's, again, I keep talking about the salami tactic, right? You don't need to go for the whole sausage. Go for a slice, then go for another slice. And I think during and in preparation for a, a downturn, yes. however big or bad, it's just saying, fine, we're going to cut back, we're going to slow down a bit, we're going to prepare, we're going to temper greed, we don't have to go, you know, go, go try, take everything. Um, and I think that this tempering greed will allow us to get there. You talked about socialism and capitalism. That's the problem, I think. We've been so used to just definitions of things without looking at, you know, substance over form, form over substance. I think we need to work on substance. And the substance doesn't mean what, de doesn't need definition. definition. We have to work on what is the solution, how does it best work in a politically realistic, in a socially inclusive way and a pragmatic way, where we don't fight human nature. We find a way within human nature and within the pragmatic way in which it can be rolled out, how do we make sure it comes out? And I think you need you know, very sound politicians, political leadership, because without political leadership, it's very difficult. Yes. You know, and we need people like Chin Tong and all that in, in, in government, because these are the people that understand how to be pragmatic and how to roll things out that are necessary. And then you need business leaders to accept and understand that they are not disengaged from this that they are part of this and they have got to play a role and, a, and have a solution uh, and help create a solution for them. Um, and I will, I, will, I will say this to, to, um, to, the, to the Deputy Minister and to, to politicians, you know, you have to use businesses and businesses must have them. We are very smart people. We take companies, we turn it around, we spin it, we, we build it up, we, we, you know, we save it. We do all sorts of things. It's like we take a dead duck Right? And we have the best accountants in the world that will fix the bones of the dead duck and attach new arteries and veins and pump blood to, through. Then we have the best lawyers in the world that will change the death certificate to a living certificate. And then we have the best PR and advertising people in the world that will sell to the world. This dead duck is now alive and it's also laying golden eggs. Yes. This is what businessmen do. Right? Now, imagine if you took a little bit of that ingenuity and used it to try and support and fix a social issue, a social de development issue, a problem within government, a problem within society. Imagine what is possible in that kind of partnership. And I think that's where we need to go forward with, beyond definitions, but the substance of what can happen. Sir, your thoughts? Uh, I agree with you. We know that substance is more important than labour. I think that is definitely true. And uh, there is also this whole idea that Socialism and capitalism are mutually exclusive. It is not necessary. Yes. What we are talking about is actually the importance role of the government in regulating, but actually also creating the ecosystem for the businesses to thrive and also eventually ensuring the, e the economy doesn't collapse. Now, tempered grid has a problem in the sense that if everyone is not spending, then we are going into a downturn, sometimes going into a downturn in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So how to ensure that we are not going into a downturn and we're not going to a downturn in 
because everyone is not spending, to a certain extent, you need the government to spend. Now, of course, when government spend, they, they are prone to also, for, for instance, corruptions, for instance, wastefulness. Now, how do we ensure that this doesn't happen? I think it's important that the role of government must be defined. And the role of government over the last 30 years has been too focused on inflation, control inflation, control interest rate. I think when we talk about the economy over the last 30 years, we ignore the role of government and we think that government has only one role, that is to ensure that inflation doesn't exceed 2% and uh, interest rate doesn't go too high. But actually, the most important role of the government in the economy is to ensure employment. Because as we not said earlier, if everyone has money to buy from you, then the businesses will thrive. But if everyone has no money, and for instance, the case of Malaysia and Asian countries. Malaysian and Asian countries became very much developed in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, because we were exporting to the US. We were exporting in huge amount to the US before China was doing it. But by 2001, when China joined WTO, our role as an exporter to the US diminishes over the years, gradually. But since 2008, US itself is no longer able to consume that much of products of Malaysia or even China because US since, 19, uh, since 2008 has a diminishing middle class. So what do we do? What China did was actually to increase pay for its workers two, three, four times over a period of five years between 2010 and 2015. So today, China's university entry salary is much higher than Malaysia's university entry salary. So China created a domestic consumption market to consume the products of China. But for us in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia, we will have to figure out what to do. And I think we have to come back to these questions of jobs and pay. If we cannot come back to these questions of job and jobs and pay, we will not be able to create that market for the business to thrive, for business to make money. Going back, before I end, just going back again a hundred over years ago, when Ford created T-Model, what did Ford do? Ford paid his workers very, very well in order that the workers has money to buy the car. Now, we must always remember that in capitalism, it is not just capital that generate growth. It is also the workers. And that is a message, a Labor Day message. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time allows only 30 minutes. So, and there was a request for a Q&A. So I will probably facilitate one question for each of the gentlemen, one question each from the, from the audience. Um, that's all we can take. So uh, if... if uh, uh, one question for each, okay? So whoever asks the first must go to the other one. Okay, so the gentleman in front, uh, raising your hand, please. Go ahead. With a bow tie. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, you think you're a socialist, you might be a social capitalist. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> substance, substance. Thing which I think is very important 
is also this, you, the undermining of the price of labor. So capital is always so proud of being the most richest, etc. But how was that capital accumulated? I know. So uh, who are you asking? The sorry, question sir? is directed at Mr. Capitalist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, is it possible as a capitalist that you can have socialist ideals and use capitalist tendencies to achieve those, those that's, ideals? That's what he's okay, thank you very much. I think that's a very, very important question. And I, I, I thought I'd answer that earlier, but let me just repeat what I said earlier. What you're saying is true capitalism. Yes. True capitalism concerns itself with how society operates because that's how capitalists thrive. It's not about capital alone, as, as the deputy minister said. It is about capital, the use of the capital, and the workforce that ensures the capital delivers product and delivers results. Now, what I said earlier, and to me, as a, I consider myself a social capitalist. And the person that accused me of being a social capitalist was Fidel Castro. I had a communist accuse me of being a social capitalist. Okay? And for me, as I said earlier, in my world of true capitalism, of social capitalism, is where we are wealthy enough in society where there's a minimum for everyone. Society must be responsible. When I say society, I mean businessmen, everyone, must be responsible for a minimum quality for all, which is a full stomach three meals a day, a full head, access to education, if they want it, and a roof over their head, right? Safety. Now, it doesn't matter if that roof overhead is a hostel, a bed, but they must have those three things. All I'm saying is that is what society must provide across the board. Yes. After that, what you get paid, how much more you want to do, then market economy takes over. But we play a role in making sure that minimum is maintained yes. and that minimum is provided so that those that are able to and want to can keep rising. Yes. Those that can't and just want to maintain this can, can maintain and they're taken care of and they're given the minimum quality. That ensures society grows. That ensures wealth is created. That ensures those that want to be rich can sell products to people that have money to buy. As you know, that ensures there's jobs. That ensures there's hope. And hope is a very powerful, powerful tool. Yeah. Without hope, you have Palestine. Without hope, you have many countries in Africa. Without hope, you have many countries in, in Southeast Asia even, historically. So it's this combination, and we cannot, def we cannot uh, how can I say it? We cannot dismember this. We cannot separate these issues. It is all together, and it has to be discussed together. Uh, and we have, as I said, that's why I don't like definitions and defining yes, things, yes. because that just means it's this, there's this, you know, there's this little silo, there's this little silo, that this is a silo. We can't have silos anymore. And, and I think that's what's very important. Look, we live in a very oxymoronic world. It, it's crazy. We have a situation where at the same time, we have epidemics of both obesity and starvation. Sometimes in the same country. It's ridiculous. We have situations where we value companies at nonsensical prices with no logic. Uber is being valued at $90 billion. Still hasn't made a profit. Don't know how much profit it's going to make next year. But its valuation is $90 billion. And a company making a, you know, $500 million US dollars is being worth $1.5 billion. Or two. There, there's no logic to our systems now. And, and we don't do anything about it because we say that's just the way it is. And I think we need to break that. We just need to break the entire paradigm we have. We have to shift. And it's going to take a major shift, but we have to shift. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, one question for the Deputy F Minister, please. Uh, for uh, the gentleman raising his hand with a blue shirt, please. Hello. Uh, first, I want to thank the first question about uh, socialism. But for the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, whenever the market fails, or like, like in the Great Depression in 2008, the people run to the government and usually blame them for the business corruption. As a Malaysia for a case study, what the government can do to make sure there is like true capitalism benefiting the society, like Malaysia as a case study? Yes, yeah, so Deputy Defense Minister, please go ahead. What, your, your question is, what can Malaysia do in order to, to ensure the capitalism... That, you know, as you said, true capitalism is achieved in the society. Okay. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think Malaysia, uh, with the change of government last year, has an Im important message to the world. If this government, the new government, does well, then it shows that you can actually tame uh, greed within the government and also in the businesses. You can create a system with integrity and you can create a system that actually delivers for the majority. What I want to say is that I I'll define myself as a social democrat. Why democracy matters? Democracy matters because politics matters. Now, very often over the last 30 years, when we talk about capitalism as if you don't need government. But when people talk about government, they talk about government in a very bad light. They talk about politics in a very bad light. Politics are corrupt. Politics is indeed corrupt in many places, including in this country. But politics is also where everyone eventually has a vote. When everyone has a vote, it creates a balance, especially in places where people actually have a vote. It creates a balance in the sense that if capitalism goes too far, the people are, are there to remind you that everyone has a vote. And everyone has a vote. There are two ways to win votes. One, you create hate, like Trump. Two, you create hope and to win them. But to win them with hope, you have to deliver social goods. And how to deliver social goods is another matter that we uh, now as a new government will have to deal with. And we are still learning, we are also learning from you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'd like to give a final minute or so to, for our closing remarks, basically to invite our two distinguished panel to address the youth. This is a youth conference, and the title is How Do They Claim Their Future? Um, amidst all of this talk on perhaps the glooming uh, definition of uh, capitalism and perhaps a hybrid of both and giving importance to substance over form, uh, as very experienced men in your fields, how, how can you advise our um, impressionable youth now that's all here um, to perhaps make a better world than what we have, we have created or we are creating right now? Your closing remarks, please. Uh, number one, don't believe in cliché. There will be lots of cliché that, uh, that is told to you, but every time is a different time. Every time is a different time. We learn from history, but we have to find solutions for that particular era. I think we are at the end of a 30-year period since 1989, both on international security and also on economy. Since 1989, there was a sort of world order with US as the dominant player, with no other people challenging. But I think that era has changed. U.S. is still influential, but U.S. is not the only player. There are other players challenging U.S., and we are in a different situation now. And over the last, last 30 years, we have been thinking that capitalism in its fullest uh, maximum form would be the solution for the society. But today, we are seeing a backlash. The backlash comes from populism, but the solution can actually come from some balance between social and capitalism or between social, uh, between social democracy and capitalism. Some middle road uh, centrist position can still be the solutions. But anyway, for anyone who is younger than me, don't listen to any cliche. Read history, read more, but be prepared to find new solutions. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Um, you know what? I'm my advice is going to be through a little story. Let me just tell you one experience of how I look at money, because I think money is what this is all about. Whether we're talking about capitalism, socialism, labor, employment, it's money, right? That's how we survive now, that's why we live by. So a lot of people ask me, why do I treat the money with the way I do? Uh, which is, they think not, with not much respect. Let me explain what happened to me when I was younger. When I was about 16, my mother was the deputy chairman of this Spastic Children's Association in Slango. Uh, in Malaysia, and every two weeks she would go to have a, a meeting with the governor's board, board of governors. And when I was back from boarding school in KL, um, I would join her, and while she had the meetings, I'd run around and play with the kids that were there for that, for that weekend or for that day. 
I, I became very close friends with uh, a Down syndrome kid. I can't remember, he was nine years old, 11 years old at the time. His name was Philip. And I'd go there, I'd put my stuff on a workstation, I'd be running around with them and playing with them, etc. until my mother was done and I'd go home. After the second session, I found that I was missing one ringgit, five ringgit, and ten ringgit notes from my wallet when I left it on the workstation. And I was very upset because, you know, if you're a student, one ringgit, five ringgit makes a big difference. Okay, and it was my holidays and I was very angry. And I remember telling my mother, I'm going to find out who's stealing my money. I'm going to put a stop to this because this is, what's the point of helping people if all they do is steal your money? And I was really angry. My mother tried to calm me down, but I was very, very angry. And I was determined to go at the next session, which was my last session before I left to go back to school, to just confront people and find out who stole my money. So I arrived there all angry and ready to find out. And I arrived at the uh, center. And as I came out, before I could say anything, Philip pulls me aside and says, if you know, if you know, come with me. Uh, and I went with him. He took me to his workstation and he had this big manila card, this big, big cardboard, uh, sitting on his table and magazines. And he had cut up these magazines, pictures, and he had created a collage, a poster for me with different pictures. Because he knew it was my last day and he wanted to give me a gift before I left. And I looked at the collage carefully. And within the collage were cut up pieces of one ringgit, five ringgit, and ten ringgit notes. And he looked at me and said, I ran out of colored pieces of paper. I hope you don't mind, I borrowed some of yours. <laughs> it took a nine-year-old Down syndrome kid Teach. to remind me that I was getting angry, upset about colored pieces of paper. We kill for it, we hate for it, we love for it, colored pieces of paper. That's all it was to him, colored pieces of paper. That moment, I first felt that small, I felt that tiny. But from that moment, I understood what money was. Money is a tool. It's like a chair. I don't have a chair, I sit on the floor. Money will never control me. I control it. I direct money. Money doesn't direct me. I tell it what to do. It doesn't tell me what to do. And so the advice I would have you going forward is a very simple one. I think that's what you have to look at in life going forward. Don't get caught up with money, with wealth. Those are tools. Think about what you do with those tools. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored to be in between two amazing men. Um, if we were to restore the faith in capitalism and free markets, I suppose we have to find ways to ensure that the rewards of it and the profits of it extend to far more people. Achieving that will require candid dialogue and close collaboration between government and business. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and we urge you to own your future.